uh, one of the, as I said, uh, stars of that film is uh, the great publisher, also from Australia, uh, Julian, Ass- Julian Assange. Thank you, Julian, for uh, joining us today. Are you- hey, Randy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you for being part of this. You know, I've been trying to get you for about six months now, and I'm thrilled that you are on. I have the greatest journalist on the planet and the greatest publisher on the planet at the same time, and both are from Australia. Uh, you've known John for a long time? I, I've certainly known of him for, for many decades, and I've known him personally for maybe eight years now, uh, and he's been a, a big supporter in the, in the situation uh, that I'm going through in this country. Yes, and uh, let's let's uh, talk about that, uh, what you're going through. A lot of people really don't understand why you are there. What did you do to be there and be a political prisoner inside that embassy? So it's, it's interesting. Uh, do you need to do something in order to have uh, in order, order to have a kind of modern interstate system? Uh, make life very difficult for you uh, and detain you without charge, in my case, for seven years. Uh, I'm not sure you do. Uh, That's part of the problem when justice becomes arbitrary. Uh, The system doesn't just strike out uh, at its critics. Uh, The institutions that comprise it are also fearsomely stupid, uh, especially where uh, they're engaged in secrecy because um, excellence is not uh, promoted by secrecy because poor work uh, can be covered up or uh, poorly performing contractors um, are not favoured over uh, under uh, uh, contractors that perform well. So I'm not sure you, you do actually need to do anything wrong. The system can just come down uh, on your head uh, and you can be you can be swept up in it for decades. In my particular case, of course, uh, I um, have rather specialised in my life since being a young teenager in provoking the hell out of it. Uh, so, so I do kind of under, understand that it's in that sense uh, it's to be expected in the sort of world that I am living in, which is uh, exposing these large and powerful organizations. And of course, by, by definition, if they're large and powerful, they have an ability to uh, suppress their critics in one way or another. And I, I wouldn't say that it, it's particularly about uh, suppressing me individually, but the example is, is that perceived as terrible. Uh, it's like Cuba itself was uh, at least post-Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, strategically not very in- important. Uh, but as an example to the rest of Latin America, uh, it was extremely important in encourage- encouraging uh, defiance of um, the will of the U.S. government and the various security complexes that make it up. Do you, uh, uh, Julian Assange, uh, believe that there is, I mean, I do. I mean, you, you mentioned this yesterday on another show about the uh, modern uh, McCarthyism. Could you uh, elaborate on that? I, I should answer your previous press question properly, because uh, I'm sure, sure your listeners will be irritated. Um, just, I answer this question so often, it becomes a bit boring to just kind of look at, at the facts. Um, but... WikiLeaks uh, started about a decade ago, uh, and we publish uh, authentic materials, official materials from all around the world. Um, the U.S. produces an unusual number of them, uh, so we tend to publish more from the U.S. than from other countries. Uh, and that's easily understandable when you realize that the U.S. has the most amount of money going into uh the secret state. So there's more than 5 million people in the United States with security clearances, uh, well over uh, 1.3 million with top secret security clearances. So that effectively is a state within a state. And then the cultural values expressed uh, in the 
United States, it, its own uh, self story uh, has some honourable cultural traditions, and those come come in conflict with the reality of US foreign policy. Uh, so the tension between the two uh, produces incentives for whistleblowers and, and dissidents to emerge, then simply the, the scale of it uh, means that quite a number of them do emerge. Mm -hmm. um, and so a grand jury was started in 2010, um, what the US government internally called a whole of government investigation, criminal and intelligence investigation against me and other people in WikiLeaks. Uh, one of our lead sources, uh, Chelsea Manning, was sentenced to 35 years in prison. Uh, he was uh, severely abused uh, in 2011, uh, 2012. UN Special Rapporteur on Torture formally found that he had been subject to cruel and inhumane uh, treatment. Uh, that grand jury uh, continues on in, in my case, uh, and the U.S. government has just announced that it has expanded it to also include our recent CIA uh, publications. It's run by the National Security Division of the DOJ and by the Criminal uh, Division of the DOJ. It's a, it's a big thing. It's it spread agents all over the world, uh, chartered private jets to Iceland, pulled people back to be secretly interrogated, coercively forced people uh, to testify. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, there's an extensive series of legal maneuvers by my lawyers uh, and the lawyers of uh, Chelsea Manning and also some NGOs in the United States to, to try and check uh, that ongoing process. And in response to that, uh, the government of Ecuador gave me political asylum in 2012 and there's a, a variety of complications of other legal processes uh, and I've been physically in the embassy since that point in time. Uh, let me just kind of conclude with the most recent developments. On the 5th of February 2016, the UN announced its formal finding. Uh, I sued the states of the UK and Sweden uh, at the United Nations, and uh, I won, uh, and it was ruled that I should be released immediately and compensated. Uh, the UK then appealed uh, that ruling uh, and it lost on the 11th of November. I see. And, and so uh, where does it stand now? Uh, where, what is the legal battle ahead at this point in time? I mean, it's a two-front battle. You, you have the U.S. and then you have this these trumped-up charges uh, from Sweden. No charges, Randy. No That's charges. Right. I'm I sorry, trumped-up allegations. Any point in time. Okay. All right. So you've never been charged with anything, is what? That's the deal. You've never been charged. Well, that's, I'm sorry that I said that, but they keep throwing that out there. And so, why does Sweden that's, want you? Well, Sweden has shifted uh, in its position. So, so Sweden became well known in the. This is the interesting story. I will try and get through it quickly. Uh, <laughs> going back. Going back to the 1920s, Sweden entered into that period of uh, European uh, utopianism that was there both in the, on the Nazi uh, right uh, and that was present in the left. Uh, both those elements were strongly present in Sweden, in, including uh, the Nazi party. Sweden itself had a relatively new um, vision of democracy. It's not, if you look at its, its origins, it's not really part of the Western European cultural process. It introduced political parties about the turn of the century. Then when it entered into World War II, it allied with uh, Nazi Germany. Up until 44, when it saw that the Nazis uh, were going to lose, and then it started to uh, shift its alignment to uh, the United States. Uh, but it never properly denazified. There was no revolution or anything like that. And in the, uh, in the war period, Sweden became very rich. 
I'm not from Sweden, by I'm an Australian, but I've become a bit of a Sweden nerd. Uh, in, in the war period, uh, Sweden became very rich uh, by breaking sanctions and setting up a lot of German fronts within Stockholm uh, and shipping about 40% of all the iron ore uh, to the German uh, war machine. So it, it came out at the end of World War II with about two decades of advancement compared to the rest of Western Europe and was one of the uh, wealthiest countries in the in the world of any size, uh, the, uh, its nearest rival being the, the United States. So it leapt forward about 10 years in terms of uh, economic development and the rest of Western Europe went back about 10 years. The result is that uh, Sweden took on an appearance of uh, accelerated uh, modernity. And the utopian elements that had existed in the 1920s came together in this post-war period to produce not a classical social democracy, but something rather different. Uh, Sweden is the most oligarched uh, country in Western Europe. What does that mean? It means that just a few families control more of the wealth in the country than any other country uh, in Western wow. Europe. I had no so idea. These giant Swedish industrialists um, uh, were, were never uh, uh, stripped of their power by revolution uh, or liberation as a result of uh, kicking out an occupying force. Instead, a, a system of a merger between the industrialists uh, the, old, the oligarchs, you would say, in a modern context, uh, the, the unions and the political parties occurred. And that ended up producing uh, what we would call a Swedish uh, social democracy. And that then became famous as something in, you know, as a kind of political phenomenon to be, to be envied. I think it's, looking back, it's really rather questionable how true that ever was. Uh, but by the 1980s, uh, it had shifted its, it had shifted its uh, position and started to uh, publicly ally itself with the West. But no one really cared uh, by that point in time. Under the surface, it had uh, entered into a secret uh, intelligence sharing agreement by 1954 uh, with the GCHQ in the United Kingdom and with the National Security Agency. Uh, in the United States, and that went to a, a mass surveillance uh, agreement in the in the early 2000s, and the Swedish uh, military-industrial complex, which is a big part of the Swedish economy, uh, sort of became very tightly integrated with the U.S. Uh, and U.K. Uh, supply chain. So Sweden, as a, uh, a state, it has its problems like all states. It has some good things going for it, but it is not in any way uh, independent uh, from the United States, yeah. unfortunately. Well, I thank you for that history lesson. I had no idea. I, I mean, I, I look back at Sweden in the 80s. Uh, John Pilger is on the other line uh, talking about Nicaragua. Olaf Palme uh, certainly helped out Nicaragua a lot, and that's the vision I have of Sweden back in the 80s, and I thought – it was just recently they drifted on this right uh, wing course, um, but that's no. It's been happening. It's been happening since at, at least eighty six when Olaf Palmer was assassinated right. uh, in Sweden. Yeah, but I mean, there, there was a period of time, about five years, really, where Sweden was supplying about a quarter of the budget uh, of the ANC, not for very long, uh, and was also. Uh, taking a number of refugees for, uh, from Chile under Pinochet routed through uh, its embassy system and so on. So it's interesting to think what that was about. Uh, Sweden historically is a, uh, a country of empire, but as the as the as Western Europe, other Western European countries uh, got bigger, it hasn't been able to kind of seriously. Um, invade countries out of its borders uh, for about 200 years now. But it, it does have a, a certain uh, uh, ideological, em empirical 
uh, ambition from time to time. And that, and that has allied with uh, particular uh, other ideological uh, or geopolitical uh, tendencies in, in the rest of the world as time has gone by. But since the, since the late 80s, uh, it's been very much uh, in the embrace uh, of the United States. Um, that's uh, some analysis there. I told. They don't like to. They don't like to say it. They, I mean, I know they have this image of being some progressive uh, nation like Switzerland being neutral. Uh, but I, I got to move away from that because we have four minutes left here. This is moving very quickly. I, I we got less than four minutes. All right. So um, I have to ask. I have to the this this whole thing about Russia and trying to uh, vilify you as some agent. Of the Russians, it's complete garbage. What is your response to that? Well, it is complete garbage. I would publish more than six hundred thousand documents about uh, Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin. Many of those documents have gone on to legal court cases, uh, and books have been written about the uh, Russian organized crime uh, as a result of our publication. So it's just complete nonsense. Uh, if you look at what the allegations are about our non-electoral publications. Well, uh, about a year and a half ago, we published John Brennan's emails, the last Obama head of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, The allegation there that everyone doesn't say very much about it because it doesn't help them politically, uh, is that those were hacked by a 16-year-old boy uh, in the UK Midlands. Uh, and he had a pal in the United States who's about, 20, about 22 uh, who helped uh, promote him. That's the allegation. Uh, and they've been formally, uh, formally charged. Our most recent publication about the Central Intelligence Agency, a very serious publication. In fact, it's the largest intelligence publication uh, in history, or will be by the time it's uh, complete. Definitely the largest uh, known intelligence leak in history. Uh, the allegation by the uh, by the U.S. government is that that originates from uh, a contractor. They haven't worked out which one yet, they say, uh, but that's the allegation. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of, it's very boring in a way. It's the uh, yeah. Democrat. Yeah. It's... I mean, it's kind of really, it's obvious stuff. It's the Democratic Party normally on election loss would go through a hell of a recrimination game uh, and uh, see who was responsible for the loss uh, and purge them from their positions of influence and and replace them with others. Right. That was a historical moment that the Democrats could have had. They uh, certainly could have. My my opinion is this. They they, they could have had that. They could have had it. But they were successful in hyping up this Russian narrative and thereby distracting uh, from what would be the normal course of events. I would like to invite you back next week. Uh, This is just the beginning. I want to talk about Vault Number 7, about Grasshopper. There's so much to talk about. We just barely broached uh, some of the things that are on my notes here. I want to thank uh, Julian Assange, uh, the greatest publisher, man of great integrity. John Pilger, one of the greatest, the greatest journalists around today. The two of you say goodbye to each other, and uh, we'll... uh, Randy, I'd, I'd, I'm not saying I'd, 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 I'm not good, saying good to John. hear you. Randy, I just want to say it's, it's, it's Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that have returned honor to, to journalism. Julian is a truth teller, and that's what has upset the, those who continue what Goebbels called the big lie. I certainly agree with you. Thank you both. Uh, This has been a very quick hour. Uh, This is Randy Credico, live on the fly. Uh, Two great men from Australia. Thank you both, and uh, we'll see you next week at the same time here on WBAI.